Thanks, everyone. Welcome back to day two. Um, hope everyone is having a great time. I know I've been really enjoying this conference, and I'm looking forward to um, talking to more of you today. Um, so I thought um, we would just take a few minutes and um, talk a little bit about what is coming in the next Ceph release, Ceph Optibus. Um, yesterday, I talked about what our priorities were that we set a year ago and what we did for Nautilus. And so I wanted to give everyone a glimpse of what our priorities and what we're thinking about are um, for Octopus. So um, this is a lovely picture of an octopus I found through Google Images. Um, I mentioned yesterday that we used to think of the Ceph priorities in terms of the four sort of um, components that we picked out uh, a year ago. Um, but that, um, on upon reflection, we had a discussion um, on Saturday with some developers and sort of revised that thinking to sort of group things in five categories or five themes. Um, it's, it's somewhat um, all-inclusive in terms of this is like everything that we kind of feel like we should be doing. So it's, I'm not sure I would describe them as priorities, rather than, um, but rather call them themes because um, all of these are important. And so I really need to be looking at all of them. So, but I'm going to go through them and give you just a glimpse of some of the things that we're talking about for Octopus. Um, these aren't necessarily um, guarantees that they're going to be in the next release because um, we have to sort of revise our planning and so on. Um, but this is really what we're, what we're thinking about. So I'm going to start with uh, usability, making Ceph easier to use, easier to manage, easier to consume, um, and easier to operate at scale. And I think the biggest piece in this category is around the, the orchestrator API um, that I mentioned before. We really want to um, improve the, the cluster's ability to um, reach out and talk to either Rook or, or um, some sort of, sort of bare metal type orchestration tool, currently based on SSH, um, although we might generalize that to be something as simple as run this command on this host, and maybe SSH is one way to do that. Maybe we plug in other remote ex execution frameworks. Um, but the end goal for Octopus, our hope is to expose um, all the basic functionality via the standard Ceph CLI, things like adding OSDs, replacing OSDs, um, uh, provisioning new monitors, adding a Rados gateway daemon, um, adding an MDS, removing an MDS, all those sorts of things. Um, and so to expose those basic set of workflows, either both through the, through the CLI and also through the dashboard, so that we finally have sort of an end-to-end -end, um, GUI experience for, um, for those subclusters. Um, that's the goal. And how far exactly we get, because you know, it goes on. We can have NFS demons, iSCSI gateways, although that one's actually, those two are actually um, in pretty good shape. Um, how far we get um, remains to be seen, but we want to have some basic set of functionality that's all in place. Um, and part of the goal here is to take the sort of the venerable historical Ceph deploy tool and capture um, all the things that you used to do with it and basically bring all that functionality, functionality so that it's built into the Ceph cluster um, so that you could actually have sort of a, a single bootstrap phase that just brings up one monitor and one manager for a new cluster. And then you use all of these orchestrator commands day two operations to deploy the rest of your Ceph cluster. Um, and once we do that, this paves the way to have sort of a standard set of um, processes in the Ceph documentation um, that are consistent for all users, um, whether you are kick things off with Rook or you're using sort of that bare metal approach. Um, we can have consistent documentation for replacing disks and so on. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, one of the things that this unblocks is the possibility of finally automating upgrades. Um, every time we have a major release, um, you know, it's like a 15 item list to like make sure this is the case, upgrade the demons in this order, double check that this um, health state is set this way, you know, run this command. Um, there's, it, the, 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 the set of steps vary a little bit between each release, um, but we'd like to be able to automate this more. And the challenge here is figuring out um, what the division of responsibility is between the orchestration tool that is probably going to kick this process off um, and how much Ceph can manage on its own. And so we're, we're discussing how we can do that so that the a manager module can handle all of those sort of internal Ceph dependencies and, and careful gating and sequences and so forth, um, um, but still leverage this orchestration API to go through and automatically do the OSD restarts and make sure your PGs repair and all that stuff um, and so that your upgrade can proceed. Um, in a nice fashion. So this is coming, um, and we're excited about it. Um, one of the other sort of last things, um, an item that is going to be worked on for Octopus in the usability category, category is taking the thing that we did for RBD top that lets you identify the top IO users and do the same thing for CephFS. Um, so a uh, small thing, but very useful for, for actual operators. Uh, in the quality category, um, 
I think the biggest effort here is, um, and best step forward, is around the, the telemetry and crash reporting that I mentioned yesterday that's new in Nautilus. And so right now, Nautilus now has the ability to phone this information home once we can convince users that it's in their best interest to turn it on. Um, but right now, it's just getting dumped in a database. Um, so we have to build all the back-end tools that let us um, introspect and analyze and identify trends um, so that if um, we push out a Ceph release and people start seeing a particular Ceph crash, um, and those start trickling back into the database that we can actually notice um, and preemptively go and figure out what's going on um, and fix the bug as quickly as possible. Um, and we also want to make so, sort of the back-end infrastructure tools so that developers can, can browse through those data sets and identify you know, if this particular crash is happening on these specific versions, maybe it started at this point and stopped at this point, whatever the, the correlating um, factors are. Um, we also want to make sure that um, we're doing everything we can to get users to turn on the telemetry. And if users are, don't want to do it, figure out why so that we can adjust it. Because it's, it's, it's a very delicate thing asking people to make their clusters phone home. They have to really trust that the data that they're sharing um, is not violating any of their, their privacies or policies or whatever. So we have to make sure that that's an ongoing conversation and that we're very careful um, about making sure um, that we're not um, phoning home data that we shouldn't. Um, there's an effort um, that was kicked off a couple of months ago called DocuBetter, um, which is focused simply on making the Ceph documentation better. Um, the week, it's a, it's a team that meets um, every other week um, a couple different times over the course of the month, and they discuss all the documentation infrastructure, all the tooling on the back end that automatically generates the documentation on the website, um, and also where the content and gaps are. Because um, we, we think that the Ceph documentation is one of the key areas where we can invest that will help us grow the user community um, and help onboard um, developers and so on. Um, we're also looking to find um, a dedicated person that we can contract or hire that can focus on working on the upstream documentation, um, revising the information architecture, um, just going through all of it and updating it and making sure that it reflects the current best practices um, with the latest Ceph. So if you know anybody who's interested or you're interested um, in participating in that effort, um, definitely let us know. Um, and we're also continually looking at our um, test suite, our automated test suite that we run to make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure that, that Ceph is high quality. Um, so individual components um, are meeting regularly to review what the test coverage is and brainstorming ways that we can expand right new tests to cover parts of the code that currently aren't being sufficiently tested. Um, there was a, an effort a while back to um, build a test suite that also focused on cross-version compatibility, so you can ensure that a particular Ceph version on the client side can still talk to a different Ceph version on the server side. Um, we need to reinvest in that effort and make sure that we're running those tests regularly. Um, and we've also discussed in the past, but haven't fully implemented, um, a test suite that does downgrade testing so that um, Within a major release, Nautilus, for example, if you install a point release um, and it causes a problem, um, to ensure that you'll be able to downgrade back to a previous stable version within the same series. Um, performance. Um, so one of the, the first, or the main focus areas here um, is around Rados QoS. Um, so we've had a QoS infrastructure design that's been partially implemented in Rados um, for quite a while now. And in fact, there was a great talk yesterday um, from the folks from ZTE about their efforts around this and some of their pending changes. Um, and that's all great, but um, largely this effort has been blocked um, because it depends on carefully managing the queue depth in BlueStore. Um, all the QoS prioritization happens sort of at a higher level, and once you commit to doing that work, if you're feeding your prioritized commands into a deep queue with a high latency, then it's pretty ineffective. And the trick that we're trying to address, trying to solve, is figuring out how to manage that queue depth um, in an automated self-tuning fashion so that it'll automatically adapt to a slow hard disk or a very fast NVMe, different workloads, different I.O. sizes, and so on. Um, and so we're going to put some real effort in the cycle to figuring out addressing that problem, because that's going to unblock um, being able to deliver this as a general solution. There's also ongoing work with BlueStore in general um, to improve performance. There's sort of two efforts here. One is around sharding the RocksDB that's used for metadata internal to BlueStore so that the effects of compaction are less impactful um, and the space utilization is more efficient. Um, and the other is looking at a, um, a RocksDB fork, currently a fork called TRocksDB, um, that essentially separates the, the, the keyboard 
key portion of the data and the value portion of the data into different IO streams um, to improve compaction behavior. And our initial testing has shown that the combination of these two changes um, has had significant impact and improvements in performance for Bluestar. So we're, we're excited about both of them. Um, in the CephFS space, um, there's an investment in, um, in allowing um, create and unlink operations to function asynchronously. Um, in CephFS workloads, the, the latency tends to be dominated by the fact that you have to have a round trip to the MDS for each create or unlink. Um, and so being able to do those asynchronous can unblock things like Antar and ARM and so forth to go much faster. So it's complicated, but the, the team is working through it, um, and we're very excited about making this sort of leap, leap forward in the protocol. And finally, there were several sessions yesterday about the Crimson effort. Um, that effort is continuing, of course. Um, the focus initially is getting sort of an end-to-end -end implementation so that we can test the full I.O. path um, and then observe what, how well it's doing and what, how it behaves so that we can validate a lot of our initial assumptions about how the software should be designed and how it should be put together. And based on that, then we can figure out what the next steps are. Um, so I, I <laughs> remind everyone this is a multi-year effort, um, but we're really aiming to make sure that in a year or two, when we have these much higher performance um, flash devices and persistent memory as sort of the normal um, deployment hardware for high-end, high-performance arrays, um, that, that we have the software that's ready to sort of meet those, meet those requirements. Uh, in the multi-site, multi-cluster space, you know, being able to scale beyond a single data center, um, there are a couple of things going on. Um, one of the, the biggest is around the RGW multi-site cap capability. So, RGW has multi-site federation and replication that's managed at sort of a site granularity. Um, but there are a couple key things that we're doing to sort of revise the way that RGW is structured, how the multi-site is structured, um, to sort of do the next iteration V3 of this. Um, the first is bucket granularity control of those multi-zone, multi-site um, federated uh, replication relationships. Um, one is support for sort of a pass-through storage so that when you put into a bucket, you'll actually just write it through to S3 or to Azure or something like that, like that, so that you can use RGW as a protocol translator to give you a consistent API endpoint across different um, topologies, um, different clouds. Um, one is bidirectional replication of a bucket to an external object store. So you can have an RGW bucket and an S3 bucket that are mirrored and active, active, writable, and replicating both both directions. Um, and the final um, capability is having individual objects within a bucket be able to tier out to an external storage, um, expanding on the current lifecycle policy that currently allows you to tier within a Ceph cluster. So you can also tier out to something like Glacier or its, or its moral equivalent. Um, and finally, um, we have multi-site capabilities in Ceph in RGW and in RBD's um, async mirroring capability. Um, we need to finally take a look at what we're going to do in the CephFS space. Um, initially, um, this is probably going to take the form of sort of a, a snapshot and periodic sync type of capability for disaster recovery, um, but we're currently brainstorming ideas about how we could do sort of more online bidirectional replication within the file system and how to address those, those use cases. Um, and the last piece in the ecosystem space um, is probably an unsurprising story. Uh, we're continuing to vest in, invest in our integrations with and relationships with Kubernetes and Rook. Um, we want to make Ceph the obvious storage um, choice for um, container infrastructure. Um, OpenStack, of course, is a huge ecosystem that we're already well um, integrated with and heavily invested in. We want to continue to make um, those users happy. Um, analytics is sort of an emerging um, in, uh, use case that we're looking at. Um, that's seeing a lot of traction around um, you know, data lakes, big data, um, AI ML analytics um, backed by RGW. Um, and keep our eyes out for new for new ecosystems that um, are growth opportunities um, and places where Ceph can really shine. I mentioned yesterday that we're thinking about changing our release cadence from nine months to 12 months. Um, Wires actually tweeted out a poll. The results are um, maybe not decisive, uh, but leaning towards a 12-month cadence. So this is going to be an ongoing discussion point for the community. Um, if you have an opinion here, uh, let us know. You'll see some email um, threads on the, on the list and so forth. Um, but the, the net of it would be that instead of upgrading every 18 months, you could upgrade every 24 months, every two years um, at, the, at the limit. Um, I just want to say a few words about how you can get involved in these efforts. Um, Ceph is an open community, open source project. The more people that help us, the more that we can do. Um, so we use all the usual free and open source 
tools and processes. We have mailing lists, um, Ceph Devel and Ceph Users mailing lists. If you go to the website, you can sign up for those if you're not on them already. Um, we're on IRC all the time, so you can talk to us. Um, one of the easiest ways to get involved as a developer is to go on GitHub, look at pull requests, and help review code. That's one of the hardest things for um, sort of the core development team to do is um, ensure that they're setting aside time to review new pull requests. Um, um, but it's also one of the most important things we should be doing in order to bring new developers into the community. So um, it's a good, good place to focus. And of course, just opening tickets, opening bugs, and commenting on existing bugs if you're seeing them in your environment is extremely helpful so we know how to prioritize issues and what, what we should be fixing. Um, the documentation, as I mentioned, is um, a priority and a focus to make it as good as possible and as helpful as possible to make it very easy for users to on-ramp. Um, there's now a new um, link in the upper right on any documentation page that will link directly to GitHub to let you do a pull request to edit documentation. So if you, want, if you see changes, inaccuracies, or typos, or whatever, it's super easy to, to make those changes and propose them. So I encourage you to do um, that is a, a good way to contribute. We have lots and lots of meetings. We use video chat because the Ceph development team is distributed all over the world. Um, and so there's a public community calendar. Um, we're going to send this link, this URL, somewhere else <laughs> so that you don't need to copy it down. Um, but there's a, there's a public calendar that has all of our stand-up meetings, um, all of our weekly meetings on various topics. All of these meetings are open. Um, some of them are focused towards users and are very easy for people to join and discuss things. Others are the daily standouts for developers, so developers can join and ask about the pull requests that they've opened, ask about bugs, and so on. Um, but you're welcome to drop in on any of them um, and, and talk to people. On um, YouTube, we have a Ceph channel on YouTube that has a ton of video content. So all of the talks here at Cephalocon are being recorded. They're all going to go in this channel. All the talks from last year's Cephalocon at Beijing are here. Um, all of our um, weekly meetings, most of our weekly meetings are recorded and available here. We also have code walkthroughs on lots of different Ceph components. Um, we have several of those walkthroughs that are targeted specifically at new contributors, how to get your development environment set up, um, how to write your first patch, how the Ceph code is organized, and how, it's, how to approach it. Um, so I definitely encourage um, you to look at this as a good resource. Um, and finally, we're we're in the process of revising the sort of Ceph getting it started, getting involved page that's on the Ceph website so that it has links to all of these different resources. Um, and we'll be ensuring that those are, those are easy to find. Um, and last, um, Cephalicon is only once a year, but we have Ceph days in all over the world um, in various geographies. Um, and so if you're trying to connect with your local Ceph community, um, this is a great way. So the next one is going to be the Netherlands. There's one planned at CERN in September. Um, there's going to be one, one in London, one in Poland. Um, and if you um, haven't had a Ceph day in your area and you'd like to organize one, um, the hardest part is usually finding a venue that can hold, you know, 100-ish people. Um, and then just talk to us, and we'll help you set it up. It's not actually that difficult. Um, and we would love to continue um, the successful program um, in new areas. So thank you very much.